Hello, uh, my name is Frank Downing. I'm an analyst at ARC working on our next generation internet strategy. I cover crypto assets as well as cloud computing technologies. And today my big idea is Ethereum and decentralized finance or DeFi. As we touch on in our public blockchain's big idea, we believe decentralized finance is driving a financial revolution, bringing about a more transparent, more efficient and more inclusive financial services. And the public blockchains that power it, namely Ethereum and its native currency Ether, have the potential for significant value accrual. Public blockchains such as Ethereum are designed to support more advanced, transparent transactions known as smart contracts, which, are de which developers write on their own code and deploy it on a blockchain. Smart contracts execute autonomously, their compute and storage handled by the blockchain and transparently, transparently because they are built on a public ledger. These characteristics limit the need for traditional intermediaries, reduce counterparty risk, and lend themselves especially well to providing financial services functions. An early application of smart contracts was crowdfunding via the creation and sale of tokens, which became known as the Initial Coin Offering, or ICO. This was popularized in the 2017 and 2018 crypto cycle. Since then, the sophistication of smart contracts has increased considerably as the development ecosystem surrounding them has grown. We are now seeing a full spectrum of financial services ranging from banking and lending to exchange, asset management, and insurance, all being deployed, built, and adopted on public blockchains such as Ethereum. This parallel financial ecosystem is open and global by default, and we think long-term has the potential to take significant share from traditional incumbents. Before we go deeper into the implications of DeFi, it's important to look at how we got here. The ICO boom of 2017 and 18 quickly turned into a bust as many of the projects that had raised millions of dollars overnight failed to deliver on their promises when it came time to build. What followed was a crypto winter, which saw very little in terms of asset appreciation, but proved fertile ground for developers and those involved in the community to continue building and evolving on the technology. When that technology was ready, what followed was an explosion of growth known as DeFi Summer through the second half of 2020 that continued throughout 2021. In the past year, we saw several days where decentralized exchanges, which allow for the swapping of assets on a blockchain natively, such as Ethereum, did more volume than Coinbase. Assets under management on, in DeFi protocols on Ethereum grew to over $100 billion, and stable coins issued uh, on, across blockchains also crossed $100 billion in market cap. Combined with the emergence of NFTs, which we discussed in our Web3 Big Ideas, the native currency of Ether uh, shot up to an all-time high of uh, over $4,000 in November of uh, 2021. To put in context the size and the impact these developments have on the underlying blockchain, we find it helpful to refer to total fee revenue, which is the sum of transaction fees users are paying to use the blockchain. Originally much lower, Ethereum's fee revenue per transaction grew in lockstep with Bitcoins in the first half of the year, before breaking out to much higher levels uh, through the uh, last quarter of the year as NFTs really started to take off. With nearly $10 billion in annualized fee revenue, Ethereum would sit above the median annual revenue of S&P 500 companies. While willingness to pay such high fees is representative of both demand and value delivered for Ethereum, it's also important to note that it's been the subject of a lot of criticism. Currently operating at near 100% capacity, High prices are crowding out smaller retail users and pushing them to try newer smart contract blockchains such as Solana, Avalanche, Terra, Binance Smart Chain, et cetera. This is leading to an increased push uh, by the Ethereum community to develop scaling technologies for Ethereum known as layer twos to increase the throughput and well importantly, maintaining security. Now looking at the financial applications which are being built on top of Ethereum, one framing to understand the efficiencies achievable via smart contracts is to look at the revenue earned by notable DeFi protocols compared to the size of the team required to build and maintain the project. Smart contracts are natively interoperable, meaning that developers can easily integrate and build off of existing software that's been deployed on chain. This means that rather than reinventing the wheel, developers can instantly and rapidly build on top of the innovation of others. Combined with instant settlement provided by the blockchain rails and highly transparent ledgers, DeFi protocols are able to cut out middlemen and reduce counterparty risk. This is what allows them to gain considerable efficiencies against their traditional financial counterparts. While not in the same scale in terms of absolute revenue, 
as you can see, DeFi projects are able to achieve significant leverage in terms of revenue per employee, demonstrating the benefits of building on top of open source software and the ability to trust in code rather than trust in traditional intermediaries. Once they are developed and deployed, how these decentralized protocols evolve is also a key consideration. The Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO, has emerged as a means of coordinating this protocol governance. DAOs, whose key operations are themselves encoded as smart contracts, are a formation of creators, users, and investors whose governance rights over a protocol are dictated by ownership of tokens on-chain. Rather than waiting to view a company's select quarterly financial statements or perhaps never seeing the financials of public or private companies, DeFi protocol revenue and DAO treasuries are updated in real time for anyone to examine or critique. Compared with traditional corporate governance, DAOs encourage any token holder to engage in open discourse and voting on a protocol's future. Compared with rather limited shareholder voting that we are used to in public public equities, voting in DAO can be as voting in DAOs can be as granular as approving a code change or allocating funds for a specific marketing campaign or research initiative. It's important to be clear that it remains to see how effective this type of governance can be. Flat hierarchies and governance by many did not always yield efficiencies, but we expect to see experimentation in more transparent and inclusive forms of governance to continue to evolve in the coming years. As of the end of 2021, we estimate that the market cap for DeFi-related DAOs specifically stood at $71 billion. Another key category of crypto assets, which grew symbiotically with the rise of DeFi, is stablecoins. Stablecoins are fixed value assets, often pegged to the US dollar, which are issued on public blockchains such as Ethereum. The total issuance of stablecoins grew nearly 400% or 5x in each of the past two years. Historically used by international crypto exchanges with limited access to US bank accounts, stablecoins are now heavily used in DeFi, particularly for loan denomination and exchange liquidity. We're also increasingly seeing public companies adopt stablecoins to promote cross-border payment use cases, notably recently with Meta. A, a really interesting observation is that despite highly volatile crypto markets throughout 2021, with several large moves up and down, the stablecoin market cap continued to rise steadily, even accelerating towards the end of the year. This suggests that market participants increasingly would rather hold stablecoins than exit fully to cash. It, it comes as no surprise that as the crypto markets grew throughout the year, briefly touching $3 trillion in total market cap in November, that regulators began to take a closer look. Besides China's increasingly strict crackdowns, which ended with an all-out ban on crypto activity in September, the regulatory focus in the U.S. was increasingly on DeFi and stablecoins in particular. Multiple states' regulatory bodies issued cease and desist letters for centralized crypto lending platforms such as BlockFi and Celsius, and the SEC issued a rare Wells notice to prevent Coinbase from launching its own lending service, which would have provided a high yield interest account for retail customers, all powered by stable coins. Further, SEC Chair Gary Gensler likened DeFi to the wild west of finance and claimed that in his view, many crypto tokens are in fact operating as non-compliant securities. The SEC is also investigating Uniswap Labs, the creator of the largest decentralized exchange on Ethereum. Notably, on the other hand, in recent months, we've seen both Miami Mayor Francis Suarez and New York City Mayor Eric Adams announce they'll be taking a portion of their paychecks in crypto. Despite the looming regulatory concerns, it seems that crypto is also becoming a popular issue in the, in the political sphere. It, and looking forward, it seems clear that in the coming years, we'll be seeing more regulation in the crypto space, especially surrounding DeFi. However, ultimately, we believe that setting these rules of the road will actually promote crypto activity rather than stifle it. As more conservative institutions who are waiting for greater clarity before getting into the crypto space will begin to feel more comfortable. I think it's also important to note that uh, the global nature of the crypto economy and that one individual nation's actions, as we've seen with China, do not necessarily have the power to stifle the technology. Bringing the conversation back to Ethereum, it's important to note that while it has come a long way and shows great promise, Ethereum is still a work in progress. As mentioned earlier, Ethereum is operating at near full capacity. To meet its scaling, security, and sustainability objectives, Ethereum stakeholders have an ambitious roadmap for the future. To increase capacity, layer two scaling solutions, as I mentioned earlier, 
which compress transaction data such that more transactions can be included per block, effectively increasing throughput, must be developed and adopted. A more ambitious upgrade known as sharding, which promises to bring additional capacity online, will also induce further complexity for developers. Despite being delayed several times in 2022, Ethereum is also expected to undergo a pivotal migration to proof of stake consensus and away from proof of work. As a brief reminder, Ethereum's existing proof of work consensus, similar to Bitcoin's, requires those wishing to secure the network to leverage specialized hardware, in this case, GPUs, to validate transactions on the network. In proof of stake consensus, rather than securing the network with specialized hardware and electricity, validators must post a portion of their tokens, Ether in this case, as collateral, with any adversarial attacks committed at the ne against the network resulting in loss of that collateral. This form of slashing uh, is the mechanism that disincentivizes bad actors on the network. The objectives of this migration are to increase both the security and the sustainability of Ethereum, both of which we have actual reservations about. Proof of stake effectively transfers influence and power away from miners and onto token holders. And this collapsing of token ownership and security has the potential to create a plutocracy where the earliest and richest investors control the future of the network. Further, detaching security from physical resources, namely the specialized hardware and electricity and proof of work mining, could eliminate natural barriers which are promoting decentralization. For example, validators and proof of stake may in fact be incentivized to host the network via a centralized cloud provider like AWS to achieve a greater uptime up and a reduced risk of slashing. This, of course, is a, is a natural vector for centralization. Lastly, as we touched on in our Bitcoin big idea, ARC believes that proof of work mining is not just sustainable, but may actually accelerate the world's transition to renewable energy. Keeping these concerns in mind, we are cautiously optimistic uh, that they can be addressed by a careful rollout of Ethereum's 2.0 vision, particularly because Ethereum is starting from a solidly decentralized base which is not the case with some of the other proof of stake networks. Ultimately, as we see more and more use cases, especially financial services functions being deployed on chain, we expect revenue and subsequent market cap to accrue to the underlying blockchain Ethereum and its native currency, Ether. Based on the global financial services market cap, we believe this represents an addressable market of over $20 trillion in the next 10 years. Further, Ether is increasingly an important form of money in the economies built on top of Ethereum. It is the most, for example, liquid trading pair in decentralized exchanges and NFT markets, and the most common form of collateral in DeFi lending, and is also necessary to pay transaction fees. So if Ethereum were to become a significant platform powering global financial services, and Ether were to maintain its critical role as money in that economy, we expect that it could also capture a portion of the global money supply, which today currently sits at $122 trillion. And with that, thank you for joining. If you'd like to check out more big ideas and see how Ethereum and DeFi play out, please check out our website, www.arkinvest.com, and follow me on Twitter at DowningArk. Thanks.